Hi, evening, uh, everybody. <laughs> evening, Dell. Nice to see you there. And uh, anybody else, welcome to our um, live stream event, if you can call it that, on a week where definitely uh, chaos has won over order. So it's chaos one, clockmaker zero this week, which is not a bad thing. It's just... Um, uh, an indication of being uh, nice and busy, I suppose. And so no complaints there. So hi, Franklin and Mark. Rainy, if I'm not known. All oh, right, the rain is on its way. I see like the whole weekend is like wiped, wiped out with uh, wiped out with rain. It's a bit of a shame. To say the least. Um, yeah, we're speaking to, hi Jeremy and Ian, good to see you all. We're speaking to somebody from uh, one of the, um, Cumbria, Lake District uh, properties, uh, not my properties, of course, um, this morning. And um, nice noise effects for you there. And they were saying that they'd had to close today because of flooding, uh, which is a great shame. And I saw on the weather forecast that, uh, hi, Tony. Um, thank you for joining us. I saw that, um, yeah, basically, gosh, thin material filed uh, rather quicker than I thought it might. Um, that, um, the uh, Saturday, I think, in particular, a lot of rain. Uh, so be interesting to see what next week looks like. So what on earth are we doing this week? Well, we're trying to get this um, thing finished that's been ongoing for uh, some amount of time. Oh, my notifications have just popped up at once for some reason. And um, what it is... As you may remember, if you've been here before, is we're working on an American uh, mantle clock, spring driven mantle clock. And uh, the really the only sort of significant, if you can even call it that, repair was to the winding ratchets. And uh, the view was that you could uh, just rivet them down again and um, they would be fine. And so one of them, this one here, we did exactly that, and in fact, it riveted up nice and tight. In fact, it's a tiny little bit too tight at the moment. I'll have to uh, just ease it off a bit because, as you see, the click there is not engaging safely with the winding ratchet. And um, interestingly, I was uh, doing working off-site this week, working on-site even, and one of the uh, winders of these clocks um, in a house uh, had had, a, had the experience where they're winding a long case clock and she said that uh, although she'd not been really aware of it she was aware that the um what's happened to my camera that's frozen for some reason hmm, don't know what's happening there and um the, uh, she'd been aware that the uh, ratchet, she couldn't hear it, but by the time she'd realised, um, she had let go of the key, which spun around and whacked her fingers, and of course, they um, could have damaged the clock. So in terms of a lot of maintenance with the winding ratchets are really important. So this one that I've riveted, riveted a little bit tight, um, 
is uh, no good, but I can soon ease that off a little bit. So I don't know what's happened to my um, camera picture here. The camera's working and it's working at my Zoom end, but it looks like there's the actual YouTube end is frozen um, or half of it has anyway. Is that right? Um, or is, is both bits, are both bits still working as far as you're concerned? I might risk it and just press, press a, a reset. Okay, let me have a look. See if that livens things up a bit. Uh, hi, Ken. Um, evening and welcome from South Africa. Uh, if you've got, I uh, suppose you've got this sort of terrible um, deluge of rain that we're getting here in uh, in the UK. Anyway, so tightened uh, this one up, and um, oh, frozen blast. Right. Okay, I'll have to deal with that. So what's going on there then? Frozen bench, yes, it's actually <laughs> frozen bench. Okay, I'll turn my camera on and off. See if that reboots it. No, so it's not at the. Um, it's not at the zoom end. It's at the YouTube end, by the look of it. Why would that be? Because presumably there's YouTube. Just wait for it to go through the tubes. It takes about, it takes a surprisingly long time, but I suppose there's a lot going on. Let's just see if that has freed things up a bit. Defrosted. Nope, it doesn't look like it. Okay. So, ah, oh, right, it does. Good. Now I've. I haven't been moving anything on the screen, so I can't see what on earth is going on. I'll just move my mouse over the way. I think that's it. Anyway, uh, if it's still frozen after a couple of minutes, then please let me know. Let me know. All right. Anyway, so um, what I did was on the other one, you again, if you were here, you'll remember um, quite kind of successfully. Um, but I, you know, I'm, I'm not exactly regretting. Yeah, appears to be working now. Um, not regretting starting, of course, because it's all good fun. But I made an oversized um, rivet here for this one, or the head is oversized. So it gives the click a lot of stability. Riveted on the back there, as you can see, just a plain riveted thing. And because I um, manipulated the spring, so the spring actually kind of bends in a little bit here now, rather than sticking out in this direction it's really cool i'm very 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 pleased with it um it's uh, actually kind of tight up against the wheel so super pleased with that that's a real success i think but um as they say uh great is the enemy of good so i am making another piece uh belt and braces and all that that holds the click in place so this is really kind of um future proofing the whole thing let's just move that up there so you can see now actually there we go it's already really good it doesn't um hang over the side of the click at all in fact it's actually held pretty tightly against the wheel so i'm really happy with that i think that is um useful and probably better than the other one. But as, I, but as I said many times, my kind of problem with that, well, it's not a problem with it, is do we, um, oh, you know, I, I won't go on about uh, this too much. Well, I probably will. Is But do we improve? And um, yeah, I've seen such a lot. I There's a kind of popular television program that um, made the mistake of watching about 10 seconds of it yesterday. And there was somebody sanding something and re and uh, anyway, for me, um, that's not uh, any kind of way forward. So what I'm going to do um, 
is just to make a little disc of material here that holds down the edge of the click. So it is, um, yeah, belt and braces. Now, um, this is really useful. I don't have a <laughs> one of those lovely hole punches that, um, let's just need to, there we go. Um, yay, good. So don't have one of those hole punches, but I should get one. But I was trying to, in my kind of dazed and confused state last week, um, measure this. And I thought this little um, cheap drawing circles thing is actually really, really useful because you can just uh, offer it up. It's, it's obviously doesn't give you a whole lot of sort of um, precision, but it is incredibly useful. So I'm just going to scribe that because this is going to be... I'm not going to scribe it because my scribe has um, disappeared. Let's just get that on there. This is going to be cheap and cheesy like that. Poor old tweezers. But um, yeah, that's a really useful thing to have a little drawing template. Can just about, oops, just about see my mark on there. Now this material, of course, is, I think I measured it, it's only about 0.3 of a mil. It's very floppy, but we've done a lot over the um, weeks and months with uh, materials manipulation, and you will know that this brass can be work hardened uh, really uh, quite easily. So that's what we're going to do. It is CZ108. So it's got, um, ow, it's got a great big burr on the inside. It's a bit of a pig in that respect. But it's also incredibly useful to have kicking around. So might actually have to go on a mission to find my glasses. So just using these. Jeweler snips, which again are incredibly useful tools. I've only just got these curved ones. Um, I had a pair of straight ones that I bought about five years ago, and they were really good. I don't, I didn't really see why you needed the curved ones. Um, then I gave the straight ones away and bought these curved ones. And of course, they're, um, I'm not sure they're actually any better making a bit of a pig's ear of cutting that out, but we can file off the edges. And then I'm going to start working on the, the bezel of the case, which I think is the only kind of thing that stands in the way of us getting this thing done. Now, if you wanted to, um, I'll just uh, file off the lumps from this thing. If you wanted to do a neater job of this, uh, of course, it's very difficult to turn it. Um, and I don't think we could really stamp it out that big, well, without some industrial process going on. So um, oh, now my computer is doing the wheel, of, um, the wheel of doom. So again, you'll have to let me know, shout if it's not working properly. Um, yeah, it's just like being, uh, chaos has definitely won the day today. Uh, and um, anyway, tomorrow's another day, as they say. The, uh, the good lady Marmot will see to things. So I'll just, um, so if you wanted to do this neater, cutting this thin material is quite tricky. What I would do um, if you have got a lathe is to trap it between two pieces of other material on a mandrel, then you can turn it round. That's how I would do it. Um, it's like drilling it, you know, it's really absolutely terrible stuff to drill um, because it grabs like crazy anyway, but a thin piece of material. So really all you can do, I think, um, is to trap it between two bits of thicker sort of scrap material. Anyway, I won't try to labor this too much I'm using my super handy jeweler tongs which have been definitely a buy of the buy of the year 
Um, what else has been going on this week? Well, it's been a busy old week. Not really on this channel, but we've um, I've, we've been doing this site work, and uh, which is really great. It's lovely. And what I see is, you know, on the um, Saturday thing, if you're if you come along to that. We have been, I thought you were building up for new favorite tool for the snips. Yeah, no, the snips are not. I'm I'm mourning, giving my other ones away a little bit, to be honest. But it's always I always find, I mean, in the long run, he says slightly disingenuously, it's really good to give this stuff away. These are uh, they're all right. Um the old ones were kind of just more, I don't know, a bit nicer to handle and things. These um all this fancy chrome plating or whatever is nickel plating, ain't so. It's all a bit posh for me. Um, anyway, so yeah, I've been doing this site work and um, the top 24 tips or whatever it is that is pinned to the top of the Facebook group page uh, is just like every single object you've come across. Uh, and I, I don't know how many I've looked at this week, um, Thursday, Friday, Monday, Tuesday, maybe 15 or something like that clocks um, and those top 24 tips every single time uh, they're there. So that's an incredibly useful thing for beginners in particular um, to uh, fault for fault finding and also as a checklist. You know, if you just go through those um, top tips, as I said, they're still pinned to the top of the Facebook group page so you can print them out and um, if you go through those and put your hand on your heart, oh, there was one more. I thought of a really, really cool one. Oh, I know what it is. In fact, um, if anybody, uh, too many viewers joining the new YouTube sensation. Yeah, uh, we've got the YouTube sensation. I don't know what Jeremy's, um, <laughs> I don't think there are too many viewers joining this channel. Um, but the good thing is the viewers that are here are real horological um, stalwarts. So I do appreciate it. So what we may be lacking numbers, we make up for in enthusiasm and uh, reliability. Um, yeah, so that top 24 uh, tips. So hi, Ken. Um, it's incredibly useful for the beginner as a, just as a checklist. Have I done this? Have I checked that? Blah, de, blah, blah, blah. It's just going to save you such a lot of um, heartache in the long run. So this, despite me just kind of eyeballing it, is looking probably just about smart enough now. Let's just offer it up. That's what I want. So it's just fractionally bigger than the... Um, the ratchet wheel so it just retains the, the ratchet click it's kind of fractionally bigger it's actually a bit dodge as they say but um mm. anyway it'll have to do could it do to be a fraction bigger actually so all i'm going to do now is to um turn it from this floppy bit of material thin material into something that's actually going to do some useful work. Now, if I only spend more time on it, you could flatten it out and then go over it with water of air stone to take all the burrs off and things. But I'm just going to do that with this file, which is a bit grubby. Um, in fact, it's a lot grubby. I guess I've shown you um, top tips of, um, what's the word, file cleaning. Um, I'm meant to be making a video about it, but you're making us totally gone um, by the wayside at the moment. But that's not a bad thing because it's actually been replaced with actually earning a bit of money. So um, yeah, file cleaning. So you've got your file. It's full of junk like this. It's actually, I don't know why that's on it, but anyway, it's been, it's been cleaned before. Um, when you go to the shops, and apologies if you heard this uh, before, let me just keep up with what you're all saying. Um, then this thing is uh, 
of sold as a file cleaner, file card, they call it. Um, it's not actually a file destroying tool. This is, I can't probably have um, a new favorite tool this week, Jeremy, but I've certainly got a least favorite new tool because I bought this new to make my video, which still hasn't, um, still hasn't, uh, maybe good for pet grooming, actually. Hardened steel spikes on there. So it's kind of quite, um, anyway. Uh, this is a file destroying tool. So do not use this uh, on your file. No, all respect to Silverline tools. Um, what does it say? File, card, brush, wooden, 40 millimeter. Mm. Um, but it is, I did notice, I'm not going to chuck it out because I'm AI, I'm going to eventually make my video, but it's a really nice bit of beech wood that it's uh, fixed to. So I'm going to get rid of this junk on the front. And um, don't know quite what I could use it for, but it's useful for something, maybe patting butter or something. Uh, anyway, don't clean your file with that because uh, it'll uh, destroy it. You don't put your files near hardened steel. So why would you scrub, up, scrub at them with a hardened steel? What you do instead, and apologies that I've demonstrated this many times, is get a bit of brass like this. This is kind of the thing we used to make as a student exercise at college and it worked really well. It's now been used for all sorts. But on most files, you've got, um, it's a double cut file. So you've got a series of cuts like this that are about at 60 degrees. And then you've got another set there that are about at 40 degrees. And you basically run the file cleaner along the primary cut. And that of course cuts into the edge of the bit of brass. So after a few seconds, you can begin to eject all the junk. Because if you can see it coming out there. Really useful thing. I think again, originally, not originally, but um, in the recent past, this was probably a John Wilding thing that, um, who was it? I can't remember. Anyway, probably a John Wilding thing, ideal for it, ideal for something. Yeah, some kind of, um, you could actually buy a lot of these uh, file card things and maybe walk on them as some kind of um, punishment stroke, um, meditation stroke, micro acupuncture, uh, something like that. It could be kind of quite painful and pleasurable at the same time. But uh, yeah, whatever you do with them, don't clean your files with them. Get a bit of brass like this. Here's one that I made and I put some scales on it. So I stamp my name on it, but um, sort of um, tough and all scales, which is actually okay, but it's a bit clumsy and heavy, actually. This one is much, much, much better. So I think it's eighth inch thick CZ120 probably. And it is, uh, it tapers from, I think it's three quarters of an inch to an inch and a quarter. And uh, it's about six inches long. So really incredibly useful tool. As you can see here, look, the file's full of junk, which is gonna ruin your work. I don't know why I'm cleaning this now. Oh yeah, and I remember the top 24, which should take us up to 25 or something like that tip, which if I um if I forget to add it, would somebody please add it to the Facebook group list? And that is an ill-fitting winding key, a winding crank. You see that search a lot, which is not a surprise really, because of course they wear, and also they get disassociated from clocks. Look at all the junk that's been ejected from this file. There we are. Once you got to that stage, you can go over with um, um, Barry Brass Brush. But remember, I prefer hot calls myself. Um, oh, good question, Mark. When's the next book coming out? Um, well, soon is the answer. Yeah, I've never tried the hot coals, Ian. There we go. Uh, but remember when you see these brass brushes, which is a jeweler type brush, you buy them from HS Walsh and 
probably other places, proops and stuff. Um, there's a lot that I've seen in the uh, supermarket uh, type place, like, um, I don't know, what are they call those shops? DIY shops, boys and those kind of things. You probably don't have those down south. But anyway, that look like brass, but they're not. They're um, plated steel. Uh, we've got some steel brushes somewhere that were bought as brass brush brass bristle and they are not so if you're going to use one of these this won't get the file clean this just kind of gets rid of the um the stuff that's been ejected by the actual uh file cleaner so there you go if you've got a rainy weekend ahead or even a sunny weekend ahead then get yourself a bit of three mil or eighth inch eighth inch brass and make yourself a file cleaner it's tapered um like that to a nice kind of chisel point you can see that uh, which is a good filing exercise in its own right really useful tool okay so i've um cleaned my file look now nice and clean and or free of metal anyway it's gonna file off those burrs for which i could do with a cork block and also I could do with my little steel anvil thing So I don't know who it is um, that said to empty your bag as soon as you get back from a. Sorry. They are absolutely right. Um, and I haven't done that since Tuesday. It's only Thursday, isn't it? So not too bad. So, uh, Mark, uh, when's the second book coming out? Matthew, this place I wanted to avoid working on the thought. Gosh, I mean, my whole life is a displacement activity. It's going from working on clocks to hanging the washing out to wandering around the countryside working on clocks, making videos, um, just move from one thing to the other. Yeah, the second book is basically... Um, all drafted the word how we how we do it it's a slight change we've got a really good person who did the printing uh for us last time or they arranged the printing they're a kind of copy uh setter type person typesetter um but of course in our naivety there's a good um oh well it's not a good story it's a really boring story but um behind the book is that when we first started, we actually had a proper publisher. We um, uh, were, gosh, it's a, it goes back right back to sort of the uh, 20 years nearly, I suppose. Um, we uh, were approached by Robert Hale, uh, the publishers, and everything was great. And we, um, what happened? Um, we said, yeah, we'll write a book, um, but didn't kind of really know anything about writing a book. In fact, we didn't know anything about writing a book other than we knew it needed to be done because we felt we'd looked at all the other books and felt that, um, you know, other than uh, John Wilding, Malcolm Wilde and George Daniels, they're the only three books that are, in my view, kind of really uh, reliable for beginners. Um, anyway, so we said we'd write a book but we started on writing, the, sorry, again, apologize. Um, both screens are facing that one then. Right, okay, I'll keep moving and just check that um, now I can't see. Maybe that's because I'm not moving enough. Um, I'll just keep my eye on it now. And uh, anyway, we didn't really know what the heck we were doing. So we spent three years um, writing on, well, the first mistake was that we met in a pub for the first year. So basically in the first year we wrote zero words, although we met on a regular basis and we did a lot of planning and ate a lot of crisps and drank a lot of beer and um, basically spent our forward. And uh, so we spent all the forward and we, we, but oh yeah, the camera's still working. It's working at my end anyway. It's a bit slow, I think. 
And um, so Robert Hale, uh, well, who were really polite and nice about the thing after three years, said, OK, guys, how are you getting on with your book? And we said, right, well, we have by which time we'd started, but we started on French clocks because we hadn't really thought we'd kind of forgotten what a beginner was. So we thought, well, start on French clocks. We've got loads of French clocks kicking about and we know quite a bit about them. But then we realized after that period that um, French clocks were no good at all for beginners. So we sort of said to Robert Hale, look, we don't know when this is going to happen, if ever. So we gave them the money back and they were super kind about it. And we decided to become publishers ourselves. And if it hadn't been for lockdown, we'd have maybe still not got it pushed over the line. Because right back to my original point, we hadn't realized that when you've got the Word document together, so you've written everything, you've been over it, you've taken thousands of photos, we kind of thought that was it. And we didn't realize that that was only about half uh, the work. So we spent a lot of time uh, in lockdown, knocking out book one and getting that done. Um, by which time we'd written probably 80% of the Word documents of book two, uh, which are all done and the photographs are done. Although um, just a little point about the photographs, we've used quite a lot of different clocks. And I think I might go back and retake some of them on one clock because it's going to look weird to say the least. Uh, so we're typesetting it. We had a bit of a problem with software for the, um, the layout. We were torn between Adobe and Corel Draw, and we ended up going for Corel Draw for long and drawn out reasons. And that has been quite a tricky process, and we're still learning it, but we're getting there. And um, and yeah, so the answer, long answer is the actual book is actually written. There's little bits about practice. It's called, um, what is it called? So book one was about beginners. Book two is called Establishing Practice. That's it. Book three is going to be called um, Developing, I think, Practice. And book four is going to be called Extending Practice, something like that. So uh, we meet every week, although I haven't met this week because I've been working. And we are typesetting it at the moment. So there should be draft finished draft by spring and then we'll send it out as we did before for um we're going to change the way we uh send out the book for um sort of feedback or whatever it's called because we sent it out last time quite a lot i think we sent did we send we had 50 printed anyway we sent about 30 out and um i won't say nobody but um, yeah, I think there's some internet connection problem. It's just a bit um, uh, on and off. And uh, basically we didn't get any feedback from, um, I mean, that we, that's not quite true. We got some feedback from some people, but we, I was said never doing that again. It cost us uh, quite a lot of money to send the books out. So we're just going to um, uh, basically launch it as a finished thing because we're just much more experienced now so what i'm doing this bit of metal because i'm talking too much and not doing any work at all is just raising it a bit to give it that bit of strength essentially making it into a spring and i had a message i haven't responded yet again because i've only just come back from so-called work If you've never done this, it's always useful to get a bit of brass and to just raise it, work hard on it, which makes it super springy and probably difficult to see, but it's completely sort of changed the nature of it. If you can see now, uh, where's the old bit? It was... Um, floppy and bendy like that and now it's nice and springy so i'm gonna put that on there it's not the neatest but i'm um slightly reluctant to uh do it again and then that my theory our thinking is that it's going to um hold the click in place i might make another one in the week because i've also made the center too big so it's all a bit rough but that's the uh, the principle anyway, and that is going to go on there and push together. 
And I suppose at this point, um, what we've done there, you could argue that it's an improvement. I'm not convinced that it is. But anyway, what, what did we set out to do here? I suppose in terms of evaluating our work, we set out to make the winding mechanism safe because the click was like 50% off the uh, the ratchet wheel. So obviously it would be uh, irresponsible to send the clock back in that condition. And we've explored two options. In fact, we've explored three things now, uh, but one is basically uh, a 30 second, literally a 30 second job, um, which is just gently riveting the click down again. And I would say that has worked all right, um, presumably because it's worn underneath, maybe it won't last as long again, but again, that brings us round to this uh, sort of idea. Um, uh, the, the idea that um, way, how long are you kind of guaranteeing this thing for? Um, how long does your liability last, I suppose? And I guess it's about five years, but every person will have a different sort of place. And then on this side, uh, and I've forgotten which one this is, this is the, this is the going side, I think, isn't it? Um, and um, we decided to make a new uh, rivet for the click and also to add this extra bit of material, which I'll redo in the week and make it um, a little bit neater. And um, the problem with that was it wasn't making the rivet for the click per se, but it's the fact that I tried to disassemble the thing. And basically this material, the arbor is so soft, the steel, and it's pressed together. It's just basically, it's difficult to get it apart without kind of destroying it, which is sort of what I did when I was whacking at it to get it apart. So my feeling is, uh, in, on reflection, is that I would do the click because you can do that without taking the whole thing apart. You could just drill out or knock out the click, but I wouldn't get involved with this. I mean, I suppose the be beauty of this is that we've been able to clean it now between the components, which you couldn't if you left it in place. But, you know, this is one of those um, ongoing uh, challenges uh, that we face that what do you do as a repairer when you come across an object? And in, I, I'm not sure that increasing we, increasingly we see that, but we certainly see it uh, a lot, um, that isn't designed to be repaired. I, it's either riveted or molded or fixed in some way, glued, cemented together, like um, wherever it's gone, like telephones, for instance, or, you know, mobile phones, which there's so much glue inside those things. Um, but that doesn't stop people from taking them apart and repairing them. And I'm a big fan of the right to repair movement. So anyway, make what you will of that um, good, bad or indifferent. But I'll redo that a little bit later during the week. And we've now got our two uh, winding ratchets safe. So there's some cleaning to do on that clock, uh, which again, I'll do off um, camera because watching more, yet more cleaning is as dull as anything, ditch water, literally. Um, so let's just clear a wee space. And uh, I want to move on to the bezel because that's really the only repair that stands in the way of actually getting this actual clock finished. So um, first book's really helpful. First book's really helpful. Interest fine with me. Okay. Yeah. Oh, well, cool. Thank you for saying that the first book was helpful. Um, we get very, very little feedback on that book. Um, and so what can you do with that? That's not a, a criticism. I, I presume people who buy it are broadly... Um, Uh, are broadly reading the, reading the comments, happy with the thing. And, you know, when we set out, when you set out on a thing like that, where you just having a bit of a uncharacteristic tidy up. So yes, watch out for the file cleaner. So I've got um, super busy November and a super busy February, got loads of workbook tin, but 
luckily so far, well, not luckily for the Bills, but luckily for other things, is the December and January are pretty quiet. For those of you that repair clocks, um, oh, it's really annoying. When you've got a staking set, um, my staking set drives me bonkers. But anyway, often the ends of the punches get mushroomed over. So it's nice to tidy them up. Um, otherwise, what you end up doing is putting them in the holes that way around in the staking set. And you can't see what the stake is. Uh, now, the end, this end is obviously hardened, but this end is just dead soft. So you can just file or if you've got a collet lathe, put it in the collet in the lathe and just neatly tidy that up. People often ask, do you use different files for um, when I first started at the Institute? There was a whole hoo-ha about um, files for brass and files for steel. And I remember I kind of bought into that thing. And that's fair enough, I suppose. Let's put this out of the way. But then I went to see um, a lecture given by uh, one of the like the kindest, nicest people you could ever wish to imagine. And that's Roger Stevenson, who works for Frodgems. Uh, and he may have retired now, but maybe he's still on the go. Anyway, super nice guy. And um, he's a chronometer maker. He's one of the world's uh, most sort of skilled and accomplished horologists. And um, he would, uh, Roger was a very unassuming guy, was giving this uh, lecture and somebody said, um, it was showing making a pair of hands for an Arnold, I think it was Arnold um, deck uh, watch, deck chronometer, whatever they call it. And um, somebody said, oh, do you use different files for brass and steel? And Roger just looked a bit sort of embarrassed and said, no. And I thought, that's good enough for me. That's one less thing to think about. Right, okay. Uh, so yeah. Um, I don't know whether, okay, good. So let's just see if we can zoom out without seeing the horror that is the doom, the bench of doom. Let's just have a look at this bezel. So you may or may not remember, it looks like somebody's been over the numbers with, um, gosh, I don't know. It could even be like a felt tip pen or something, or maybe a pencil, I don't, I don't know. Anyway, perfectly happy with those. We've given it a good old vacuum. Uh, to get rid of any uh, dust, as you can see, it was um, this kind of tin plate, I suppose, which is really useful because the if it is tin, um, it will have saved the uh, iron from corroding. And as you can see, it's actually corrosion free. So the tin presumably acts as a sacrificial kind of component there. And I still think the movement plates were plated as well. Um, a bit of discussion going on uh, with that. So here's the other part of the bezel. Now I'm not convinced this is the original glass. It's incredibly sort of thick and heavy. However, I'm also reluctant to get it out. Did, I think I did measure it, didn't I, before? And it was probably three millimeters, but it's a lot of weight to be hanging off this tiny little uh, hinge thing here, which I presume is not the original hinge. Um, uh, and it's held on now with a little bit of wire. It looks like it's had some rivets in at some time. Um, but lots of uh, pretty sort of yucky sort of corrosion here from flux uh, and so on. So again, you know, what, what do you do? Um, tricky. I'm actually just not quite sure how the whole thing is fabricated. Just have another little look at it. Right, okay. So there are, I'm not sure about this um, 
soldered repair here. And there's maybe somebody out there that knows a whole lot more about um, American clocks than I do, which is wouldn't be a surprise. But I'm obviously going to try and leave it if I can. Um, so there are three components here. There's this tin plate, iron dial plate. There's a pressed brass uh, bezel, which you can see has got some little tabs on there. I, that one's broken off. Weirdly, it looks like it's rusted as well. Oh, I see. Okay. No, it's not rusted. It's just um, corroded and broken through. So two of the tabs have broken off, that one and this one, and there's some corrosion on there. And this may or may not have been like that since it was new. I, d I don't know whether that was soldered on. Um, so again, what to do? Well, we could undo these tabs. I presume they would snap off two. Uh, and that would reveal two more components. So three altogether, our dial plate, this pressed brass mask thing here, and then this pressed brass uh, bezel, which has been, by the look of it, flash plated too. You can see that the plating's worn off on the high points and it's still quite gilt here. So the advantage of taking it apart would be that you could wash the two brass pieces in um, detergent and that would get rid of some of the dust is still, even though I vacuumed it, there's a lot of kind of pretty grimy dirt down here, um, which is quite kind of unpleasant. Let me have a little closer look at that. Remember this clock was in a, a garage for 30 years, something like that. Yeah, I mean, tricky one because the whole thing is a kind of time bomb. And I maybe learned my lesson a bit with the, um, I learned my lesson a bit with the, oh, it's Jane there. Hi, Jane. Yeah, a small amount of hammering makes a big difference when it comes to making brass springs. Brass springs are like my favorite thing. Decisions like this are my least favorite thing. Um, and what I really want to do to make myself feel a lot better is to disassemble this, wash this to get rid of all this kind of impacted dirt here. Because the thing's been in the garage for 30 years, God, God knows what, with no glass on it. The glass has been sitting on top, really, really dusty. So I could wash this, wash this, leave the, uh, the numbers, the dial plate as it is. But this those tabs are not going to straighten. I think they're just incredibly hard and they're going to snap off. So that's going to leave me with um, more problems. So I'm actually uh, not going to do that. I'm going to vacuum more down here. Maybe I haven't vacuumed this properly, which is why it's looking a bit grim still. And I'm going to get some um, deionized water and my swabs and I'm going to give it a good swab in. I won't do the vacuuming now, I don't think, because I probably can't find my vacuum cleaner. And I'm also wondering whether I should buy um, a museum vac. When you work on the kind of work I do on site, uh, one of the things that I'm always borrowing, and I like to be totally self-contained, I really hate borrowing things. Um, uh, and then I've got someone I'm trying to repaint the one that just made a and it's gloss paint and I'm just trying to redo and making a stencil. Oh, cool. I mean, um, I know uh, a good dial painter, a dial painter, and I really like working with her. She's super kind of sympathetic. Um, and as I always say with this, you could redo it or have it redone. But the problem with that is you're really not going to do anything with this other than clean it or the case. So I'm pretty happy to live with it as it is. What I'm not happy with is all this sort of loose surface dirt uh, hanging around. Um, so, yeah, museum vac is something that's on my shopping list, but they're a lot more expensive than a real vacuum cleaner. And they do like hardly any work, but that's quite not the point of them. Little portable vacuum cleaner. Um, 
Right. Okay. So the decision is it, once you made the decision, then actually doing the work is kind of quite simple. It's just making the decision. So yeah, that tab's broken. That tab would probably unhook. Yeah, that one would unhook. I'm pretty sure that's just for some reason where the um Maybe it's an electrochemical difference, but where the tabs, the brass tabs press, pass through the iron plate, there's quite a lot of corrosion there. That's the, um, that's the problem. There's your problem. Okay, so I'll look for a brush. Um, got lots and lots and lots of stuff to unpack. I'll just get my local friendly vacuum cleaner out. I can see, see it peaking. I was going to trap there. Vacuum, you don't vacuum direct, uh, you vacuum in the vacuum just there to stop the dust from landing on the stuff. So I've trapped that from the vice, and I'm just going to work around and just gently try and lift some of this dirt away because it's pretty grim. Yeah, the um, if I can, I'm going to try and um, spend quite a bit of time in December and January catching up with the videos and getting back onto those. I noticed that um, I made one about a watch, uh, and it's gotten like thirty thousand views or something. So, not that that's the be all and end all. But it's certainly a really good way to um, to reach a larger audience. Oh, well, so I hadn't done this before, and it's actually looking already quite a lot better. Probably the dullest thing on the planet, next to cleaning, more cleaning. But that's all, um, you know, for me, uh, a lot of this type of work is. Um, you know, if you're a conservator, and apologies to conservators, but so much of it is kind of um, cleaning and uh, trying not to break things. Just up for a slightly smaller brush. That is a bit I'll just move on to a goat hair brush, like a watch brush, just because it's a bit softer, but where these uh, numerals are painted. Should of course be wearing my gloves as well. Shouldn't be molesting the thing with no gloves on. Naughty. So that's gotten me, um, have a look. Yeah, that doesn't look massively different, but 
all this kind of loose material or most of it has disappeared now. So that's got me uh, feeling quite a bit better about that. We could do a bit of um, swabbing there as well, just to uh, lift a bit of dirt. What uh, time is it? Right, okay. Um, so I think I've shown you it before. I did it on the case. I'd used distilled deionized water, tiny bit of isopropyl alcohol and a bit of, um, Yeah, the bezel, this bezel is, oh, you, well, the both bezels are brass, uh, Andrew. The, um, yeah, don't, um, deionized water on this. Certainly deionized water, Jeremy, yes. Uh, I'll show you the mix. I think I've shown it before, but so this bezel actually, strangely, is cast. Uh, it, oh no, is it? Am I speaking complete rubbish? No. So for some crazy reason, although the manufacturer has tried to save material all through the manufacture of this um, clock, they've then gone and cast the bezel, which seems totally bonkers, really. Why didn't they just press it? So you've got cast brass, which is lacquered. Um, and the lacquer, if it's something like shellac, eventually kind of goes a nice uh, sort of golden color. And people often mistake it for um, electro or gilding. And then the inner bezel, like a French, well, not like a French clock, the inner bezel is pressed in this case, as you can see from the back brass, and it's electro plated. So it's just probably given a very flash plating of gold to make it look um, super glitzy. And then this mask is also brass, but I don't know whether that's been electroplated. It probably has by the look of it. But the electroplating is so thin, it, um, it just doesn't last. So yeah, you've got quite a range of materials. Just noticed on the, um, the cast brass bezel, we've got some copper corrosion product. Now, I'm not particularly interested in worrying about this. Um, it's absolutely fine as it is. Uh, this has happened when the clock has been in uh, a different kind of environment. So you might just soak it in deionized water again overnight just to check the, uh, the corrosion. But the problem with that is that might also affect your shellac lacquer, so maybe avoid that. Um, in a normal domestic environment, this isn't gonna get any worse. It'll, it'll just stay as it is, basically. Uh, it's been stored somewhere damp at some point. Uh, I don't even know if that's uh, slightly strangely, that's the underside. So it's not even as if something's been kind of uh, falling on it. No, I think, well, I don't know. Again, I don't know much about American clocks, but no, I think that's a proper bezel. It fits really, really well. It's just strange that they've used pressed uh, material. And then for the bezel, for some reason, a lot of brass in there. It's really heavy, as I said, with the glass and uh, such. So, yeah, the... Um... Just gone off in search of my uh, chemicals. Probably heard me wrap them back in the chemicals cupboard. Ta -da. So I'm going to use um, deionized water, regular stuff. What is a great solvent? Underrated solvent. And I'm going to put in there a little bit of isopropyl alcohol. Isopropyl alcohol, tiny bit. Should 
could probably measure this out. I'm sure in some, um, there'll be many, many publications by AIC and people like that about the sort of best uh, sort of solution for this and a little bit of Vulpex soap. Uh, Vulpex soap, there we are. And um, I think that for me is just a really good first stage for sort of um, cleaning. Once you've vacuumed away this material, and I've got these, um, the the whole the old uh, hardline conservators make their own swabs, of course. But I don't, because I'm a lazy clockmaker. So I just uh, buy these. I mean, yeah, it's a little bit of a luxury, but they're um, they last. Uh, you know, bag lasts me absolutely ages. And what I would do here is just. A little bit. And again, it's just one of those nice kind of meditative things, really. Tiny bit of uh, swabbing around here. Should really get some um, more cotton wool to do the drying. And definitely wear my gloves. I'm being very, very naughty. So looks like a bit of a faff, but actually doesn't take that long. And as you can see on the swab there, it's already lifting up some dirt. And then I'll do that and then have another little look at it. And there really isn't a lot more you can do after that. I mean, obviously, some people would take it apart and replate it or polish it or whatever. Um, but uh, yeah, that's not my bag, as you know. So that's getting a little bit of dirt off there. And you could spend a happy 40 minutes there just um, li lifting that dirt, allowing the water to do its uh, stuff. I'll just get some cotton wool to dry it with. Oh, no, I won't. I'll use another one of these. Otherwise, there'll be no journey to the other side of the workshop studio. Yeah, um, it's, it's interesting. I don't know enough about American clocks to really sort of pass a view on that bezel thing. Um, but uh, yeah, maybe the manufacturer, it would certainly give the glass a lot more support. But a lot of um, clocks have got press bezels. I mean, a lot of the sort of later dial clocks and the glass is pretty tough in its own right. I mean, did they want that kind of chunky feel when you because it was a kind of user interface the bezel did they want it to appear um because you know uh if you were into buying and selling clocks you know a cast brass bezel is a, something that uh, you can kind of shout home uh write home about a little bit so it's a nice thing to kind of show off about so maybe they wanted it from that perspective from a kind of marketing perspective i don't know now the problem with doing this kind of cleaning is it's incredibly uh moorish you get started on it and then an hour later so on but you can see it's having an effect and you can see there it's lifting quite a bit of dirt off the the bezel but i can't get it near these numbers because this white paint is incredibly sort of soft it's i don't know what it is really squidgy stuff which is probably why it's um, quite dirty looking as well. I'm not going to go near clean it, trying to clean that. If I if I was going to go there, that would be a job for a specialist, not me. And uh, we've talked about this many times. You know, where where do you um, leave off uh, in your practice? Well, it's kind of easy for me because I've got two sides to my practice one is doing things like this where it's great to be quite experimental and the other is um the actual um work work that that kind of work practice which is uh not experimental i don't know why i'm putting my gloves on now i feel very just see my own hands in the picture and if i saw them i would be um raging so uh i've now put my gloves on i've been nearly finished the job <laughs> anyway so uh to repair the bezel um i mean we could just leave it actually i think um and that sounds a bit crazy but we should explore options 
and we could leave it. But the problem with that is I think the chances are that somebody is going to drop the bezel. It increases the chance of somebody dropping the bezel and breaking the glass. And uh, it would look uh, a little bit weird, I think, if we just left it as it is. But I do think it's a good enough fit. Just dry this up a little bit. If I could spend more time on that, still lifting a bit of dirt off, even though where it's not too dirty. Okay, and this wants a good old wash and scrub as well, but I'm quite happy to very quickly just immerse the whole thing and give it a brush with my uh, Omega brush tweezers on the floor. So um, let's have a look. We've got a couple of options here. Yeah, I mean, this has been changed, hasn't it? Because uh, this is this cutout, presumably, is not original. No, I see. Okay. So this bit here is two layers. I'll find something to point with, no point in stick. Two layers here. There's the outer layer of the bezel, and then there's the, what remains of an earlier hinge which has been filed through. It's been soft folded on, filed through, that's broken away. And somebody's put this little kind of furniture hinge on, which is really quite weedy. Um, I'm stalling for time now, because I don't know what to do, but I've got to think of something to do. So I could just leave it. Um, this is just about small enough to get your hand around it, and you could just fit the bezel every, time like that the problem is you've got to get it lined up and inevitably one day it's going to fall off and go on the floor um so what i'm thinking is should i make a new hinge or joint i've never done that before but can't be that difficult can it um something that's a bit meatier because the problem with this is it doesn't actually do the job this uh let me just Zoom down there. Doesn't actually do the job. So my thought process here, let's just get it clipped together. There we are. So yeah, I'm happy that these two pieces are, are uh, original or whatever. They fit together really nicely. But what's not so satisfying is that this new bit here is doesn't line up with this and also it's not long enough it's been cut down it's not strong enough um and and so on so what are we going to do about that i suppose what would be realistic is to just get another modern brass hinge from a little furniture hinge type thing or an old one i'm sure there's plenty kicking about and um you see the way this is positioned as well it actually lines up a lot better when it's on the outside it doesn't actually line up when it's on the inside make a new hinge you've got experience yeah i think you're kind of right there uh del i would be tempted though and this would probably get a lot of frowning to um soft solder the thing together so i think you're actually um right make a new hinge get this one off this is this is not working for me uh unfortunately with this um tiny little rivets and this that doesn't fit up so what we really need because we don't need anything but is let's just get it apart is to probably would mean getting the glass out and i don't know how dodgy that's going to be but anyway because this um Somebody mentioned getting some solder wick, and that probably would be a good thing here to wick away this excess solder. I can use my sort of brushing technique. Don't quite know how you get that solder off without breaking the glass. Maybe there's a, a way of doing it, or maybe it just doesn't break, or maybe it does break. So we'd have to get the glass out, which would be an opportunity to look for thinner glass, but I'm not sure that that's going to make a massive difference. Um, and then we can get rid of that bit of the hinge there and the, the old one and make a, make a new one. 
And I suppose you could make this bit a bit wider to fit on the inside because we, there's not a lot you can do about that part that's been cut away there. You can't hard solder it. The problem with hard soldering is it's going to totally wreck all this uh, nice um, sort of aged lacquer around there. So, um, yeah, that is maybe the way forward. I think, Del, you are right. Um, I, I mean, again, when you get rid of something like this, you think, well, what's the value of that thing? And TBH, I'm not sure there is a massive amount of value in it uh, as it is, which is easier said than done. The only problem with put, fitting in your hinges, I'll have to get rid of all this, this one, which will mean heating this, which I think inevitably means um, taking all this apart as well, which I think will break those tabs off. So a bit like the winding ratchet thing, I can see um, I can see a bit of a kind of chain reaction of disaster here when we try and take it apart. Because I think what happened is when that was soldered before, these numbers have been painted later, this new white paint, because even with soft solder, it'd be pretty tricky to um, protect that from heat. And as you can see on the back, it is um, well and truly soldered to both components, both to the, and it's not actually soldered to the bezel, it's not stuck, it's only soldered to this back plate. Um, so maybe to get it back on, you could use uh, an epoxy or something rather than um, heat it up again and solder it. Although saying that, if we made the hinge so it fitted neatly inside the pressed uh, element of the bezel, um, then you could just clean it and it would solder really nicely. Uh, whether there would be any heat affected stuff on the outside, I don't know, there might be. It's always a, a risk. And there again, how do you kind of go about cleaning it afterwards to get the flux off? Um, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, well, I call it interesting, um, but maybe this is where other people on other channels say, oh, just get on with it, just do it. But actually, to me, uh, cut the soft solder and clean it with solder at the glass remove. That's true. Uh, glass with a grey one. Would it possibly scrape the solder away? Yeah, it would. Um, it, I, I, but this has been run into place, so it must have been heated. I suppose uh, what we could say was, well, the worst thing that's going to happen is the glass is going to crack. Um, solder wick, I think, is what we need. I don't have any, I don't think, but I can certainly um, get some for next week um to or i can just do what i normally do and just heat it very gently and um just brush it away let's just try that I might put my goggles on so i think we're kind of launching into um making a new uh making a new hinge which will be a bit of fun and at least it'll be relatively solid then ah oh, here's the thing actually better idea let me look at the case first before i go getting too far down the road i just wonder whether we can fit the um have a look how this all fits together. The usual problem with no space. Um, so fitting that on is not a problem because um, we can just uh, plug these little holes with a bit of wood and then re-drill the same holes just because the screws are pretty stripped. And once that little new hinge is off, that is good to go. No problem there at all. So my question is, let's just get this little monster off here. And find my cookies. 
So, that um, is off now, which already feels kind of a lot better. It'll be even better when this is off as well. That will be really quite cool. So my thinking, just before we go ahead and with the design for a new bit, is could I fix it to the case, direct to the case? So once that's screwed on there, This, um, if we just turn the case around, as you can see, I was hoping that there's going to be a gap here and I could maybe screw in from the inside, but I can't. There's no real way of doing that. So looking at this, the problem is that this, um, I thought I'm making a mountain out of a molehill. This whole thing, these two pieces of metal are really pretty insubstantial. So there isn't a lot of um, material to go at. However, once um, this part, this um, later bit here is removed, as, as uh, I think it was Dell said, and um, you could just saw that off. That's easy to do, although I don't want to saw through that little tab. But um, just with my piercing, so I could get rid of that. In fact, I'll do that now. Then I'm committed. Let's just uh, think about this. So, piercing. So, It's a blade. Really do with something to rest on here because it's a bit yucky. That's a pretty show. Cushion. Soft shoulder, it's not there. Funny stuff to saw. And make sure I'm and what I might do actually here is to um, do it the other way. Yeah, I'm gonna. Turn the piercing saw blade inside out. And try thread it through. Then I can just pull on the blade, the rather than kind of sewing into a place where I'm gonna chop through something. Yeah, that's what I thought, Andrew. Um, once this is off, I'm gonna see if I can sneak past this inner bezel on the case. 
and screw to the side of the inner case, which would be really strong. I mean, it would mean making two new holes, um, but uh, at least it wouldn't be all kind of resting on this flimsy material. So this is a nice idea whether I can actually see to thread it through. Yep, so I've got that. Oh, it's going to break, break the blind straight away. But between the, uh, there's a little tab there. So it's on the inside of the tab, on the outside of the tab, sorry, but on the inside of the joint. Now I need to get the piercing saw blade tightened up. But that means I can just kind of pull on the saw and it should be a lot safer. Not just break. Because it just kind of clogs up the blade, but I think it'll get there. These things always take longer than you think they're going to take. Such a chunky old lump of soft silver on there. Closing room hinges actually directly down, down to the case with a cutout in the dial pan to fit a brick. Okay, cool. Well, thank you, Time for Clocks. That's really useful material. So it's okay to make a new one that screws to the um, screws to the case. Great, that's really useful. Thank you for. Um... Piping up there. Which is good because it probably means we can um, do it without heating up this thing and breaking off those uh, tabs. I think we're getting there with this. It's um, have to put a new saw blade in, but maybe we'll just keep going. We've been talking a lot about uh, cutting down driving weights for long case clocks. Not not the original weights, but when you get new buying new weights, because if you can't get them the right weight, which you never can, because you want a specific amount, sawing the end off with a wood saw, it absolutely is terrible. It takes ages. There we go. Yay. Right. Good. Nice. So it's actually um, surprisingly neat doing it that way, sewing out rather than sewing in. So good. Kind of happy with that. The little tab um, has been bent out before, so it's a bit loose, but we can certainly bend that back again. So that is liberated now. So we've got our two bits there's um a big chunk of soft solder and there's the little furniture hinge thing that was on it before so uh that's great um so we can really i mean within reason make this as big as we want it, i think it's because it's been presumably cut away because there's this bit of uh 
material on here, um, then we can make it as big as we want to make it nice and strong here and then just angle it in and then uh, make a little hinge that goes on the inside and fix it to the inside of the case. Then this relatively chunky bit of material is uh, well supported. Um, so I just got to have a little think about the design of that. Um, let's just have a look. Yeah, I'm just having a look inside the case. And think how we're going to fix it. it needs a little bit of thinking about, but um, I suppose having gone this far with our intervention, um, at least if we put a decent chunky piece of material on there, it's going to be well supported if we fix it to the uh, the inside of the case. Anyway, um, I think we're about oops about done for time now. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, I suppose the um, the the benefit, if you like, of the this kind of um, open thought process, if you can call it a thought process, is that no doubt people are sat out there and then they would be going, I wouldn't do this, I wouldn't do that, I'd do it this way, I'd try this. And of course, if you ask 50 people, you get 50 different answers. And I think that's really, really cool. But I hope that this encourages people to push back a little bit on the old, there is one way, there's a right way, there's a wrong way to do things. Um, and of course, as we have seen on this particular channel, this channel in particular, should I say, that often the outcome of those thought processes is unsatisfactory. And for me, uh, in my sort of practice, this is a really brilliant play. So you're a kind of um, <laughs> guinea pigs, unfortunately. So thank you for uh, being part of that process. But um, it's actually a really great place to be sort of a bit more experimental than you normally would be. Um, and yeah, if it doesn't quite work out right or whatever, then it's sort of not at the end of the world, at least you're not doing it in isolation. And I'm a great, as you know, a great fan in sharing. And so those uh, journeys, mistakes, if you want to call them that, or uh, triumphs are at least part of a wider sort of learning experience, uh, I hope. Anyway, um, there we go. Thank you very much, everybody, for uh, joining in this evening. It's great to see all your comments and uh, different ideas and different ways of going about things. Uh, yeah, book two is on its way. I mean, maybe Easter next year, sometime like that. I, I know that once you get everything done, there's about a three months um, process of editing. Um, Yeah, I thanks, uh, time for clocks. I really like that idea, even if it means drilling two new holes. And again, very tentative about this whole idea of improvement. This relatively meaty, and I'll get the scales out and see what it weighs, chunk of cast brass and glass fixed to two really thin pressed bits of material is basically always going to be a failure point. And I'm not as I said, wanting to improve it, but at least if it's chunkier and screwed to the case, then it's going to have a bit of a longer lifespan. So maybe that's the way to go. So we will do a design and get round to a bit of fabrication. I've had an offer from Ian for a, a hinge that I might be able to uh, adapt. But actually, if I maybe just use something like bushing wire and uh, neatly solder it all together, um, so I uh, sold it all together with uh, soft solder. It should be all right. Anyway, thanks very much. We'll be here on Saturday for a little bit more oiling um, stuff, which we didn't finish off from last week on the How to uh, Open Clock Club. And also uh, Sam on Facebook was talking about turning between centres. 
I'm not sure I can quite get set up for that, but I'll certainly talk about turning between centres um, because it's an incredibly useful technique and how lots of all the, well, the all, all the clocks were made. So that should be quite good fun as well. Um, I might have a chance to catch up on Facebook. I've been a bit on the back foot because I've been working, uh, other kind of working, but um, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll catch up there as well. So thanks for joining us. And uh, we'll see you this time next week, I think. Uh, I'm around and I'll let you know on Facebook. And um, if not, then Saturday for Open Clock Club. Thanks very much and bye for now. <laughs>